Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Oval Trade Talks. I am joined today by Professor Raj Bhalla. Professor Raj Bhalla is someone who needs no introduction in the field of trade law. He is currently the Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law and a Rice Distinguished Professor of Law at Kansas University School of Law. He is also the widely acclaimed author of the treaties on modern GATT law and has recently or is in the process of publishing a two-set edition on international trade law. Um, Professor Bala, thank you so much for joining us for this interview. It's an honor to be with you and I'm very humbled to uh, be of service to the Oval Observer Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, I will be asking you a host of questions which vary uh, substantially, particularly related to international trade policy in general, and then a few questions relating to India's trading policy in particular. So let me begin with uh, the, uh, the uh, trading policy of India currently. So. Um, as you are aware that the reformation process began in 1991 itself but the pace of reforms has considerably slowed down and what we've seen in the context of trade policy is a sense of ambivalence within this whole policy making space where we are not able to decide whether we want to be a socialist economy or we want to be a free market driven economy now this is also re reflected by persistent tariff escalations and pronounced difficulties in attracting FDI. So what, according to you, is the major cause for this sluggishness and ambivalence? Well, I think you hit it uh, exactly right when you started off by saying uh, there's an ambivalence about the socialist economic legacy uh, and the more um, contemporary approach to trade that's more free market oriented. That legacy, is, as all of us who are students of um, modern Indian history know, is a legacy that comes out of the um, independence movement and particularly the experience of, of Pandaji, of, of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. Um, he had, uh, um, in, in as many good biographies of him indicate, um, he had uh, a lot of um, uh, education and a lot of experience with leading socialists of his day and had gone to various socialist conventions. And um, his socialist um, training, if you will, um, influenced um, his thinking about the Indian economy and the Indian constitution. Um, he also was very cognizant of the excesses of socialism in terms of human rights costs. So he himself had that ambivalence. He always thought that the future of India politically was in the democratic power of the people. So he never wanted India to be uh, a fully fledged socialist economy. Um, and he tried to steer that non-aligned course um, between the then Soviet orbit and uh, the U.S. Uh, dominated orbit. And India still has that, that legacy. And you see it when you um, look at debates between the Congress Party and the BJP on economic policy and trade policy. So, you know, that's sort of maybe, maybe the cause, the, one of the causes, the ideological cause. I think another uh, cause of, in terms of ambivalence about how much to jump into this free trade uh, world, if you will, um, is the, is the, the staggering um, uh, poverty um, that India still faces. Um, let, me put, let me put it this way. There's, there's very little doubt that an open trading economy, that is where the economy is open to both imports and exports, and that openness is measured by economists um, in various ways, including the percentage of GDP that's accounted for by imports and exports. There's very little doubt that an open, the more open the economy, the faster the growth rate um, and the more robust the growth rate um, of per capita GDP. Um, in other words, free market trading economies 
tend to perform better if you just look at the metric of per capita GDP than closed economies. Um, and there, there, there are many examples of that. What, so that, that bodes for the more BJP style free market, free trade reforms. On the other hand, on the question of the link between trade and poverty alleviation, there the evidence, the empirical evidence is, is, is much more mixed. It's not as clear that an open trading system for the country is going to result in poverty alleviation um, as it is that open trade will result in economic growth. And, and, and no one in India wants or should want faster growth but greater poverty. Um, everyone wants to see or should want to see um, freer trade result in greater equity. And there's concern that that might not happen. And that concern is, 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 is felt in the U.S. as well and other developed economies because we've seen over the years, the last few decades, that with more free trade agreements, more WTO liberalization with the Uruguay round, we've also seen worse Gini coefficients and other um, empirical evidence of, of inequality. So, you know, to summarize uh, the answer, uh, as to why India still has this ambivalence in its trade policy. One is the ideological origins of that trade policy going back to Prime Minister Nehru and, and, and socialist economics in, in the independence era. And the second is this, this concern uh, about poverty alleviation and will freer trade, will trade liberalization actually help the uh, five, six, seven hundred million people who face absolute poverty in India. And at which end of the spectrum do you fall in? Do, do you, would you argue more for a free trade agreement based policy or would you argue more for a policy which has some socialist inclinations? Um, you know, I, I, that's why I say I'm very much a student of um, of trade and my my I'm always learning and my views have, have evolved as I've learned more about trade and studying it over the last several decades a couple decades um, I, I, I incline towards free trade I incline towards I still feel the burden of proof um, in favor of protectionism is on those who advocate protectionism they have to give an a, 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 a clear um, and convincing argument in favor of a protective device, whether it's um, it, uh, a tariff, a non-tariff barrier, a, a sanitary and phytosanitary measure, a technical barrier to trade. The burden of proof is on those who want to um, uh, restrict or shut down trade. And, and Part of uh, the reason I say that is is the, the economic theory coming out of da uh, um, David Ricardo and Adam Smith, which, which we're all familiar with. But another reason is actually uh, grounded on, on, on philosophical and religious theory about human dignity. Because whenever um, a restriction is placed on our ability, yours and mine, to freely exchange our goods and services, um, that's that's a, that's a crimp. That's a, that's an impingement on 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 on, on that, that freedom to, to 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 do what we want with our property, and and so the burden ought to be on those who want to restrict that freedom. Um, now the the other part of the answer that I would would offer is um, when um, uh, uh, there is that there are good arguments uh, for restricting trade. SPS obviously is one of them. We've seen the Ebola crisis. We've seen uh, SARS. We've seen other um, uh, dreaded diseases um, that can be spread more quickly with trade. Um, TBT barriers are an, are another uh, good reason. Sometimes we you can talk to to, to uh, plaintiffs' lawyers who do tort cases, and they can tell you about um, substandard products. Or we've seen such products come from China in the past that have uh, uh, hurt consumers. Um, so there are reasons. 
and there are even uh, the more traditional reasons of infant industry protection um, and um, revitalizing ailing industries. Um, those are arguments that, that uh, uh, economists have, have long known and presented. Um, a third piece of the answer I would offer is the importance of trade adjustment assistance. What I mean to say is this. We put the burden of proof on people advocating for protection. The, the presumption, the rebuttable presumption is in favor of trade liberalization. That's point one. Point two is that we acknowledge that there are legitimate grounds sometimes to restrict trade. I mentioned a couple. Still another one is public morality. We've seen those cases now come up uh, in the WTO. Um, but a third point to note is that if, if the burden in favor of protection is not met by the advocates of protection, so we continue on with freer trade, we also have to acknowledge that Adam Smith and David Ricardo, Ricardo in particular, always said there would be people, specific sectors in society, injured by free trade. Not everybody is going to benefit from free trade. There will be losers from free trade. Free trade results in a net gain to society. How does a compassionate, humane society deal with the people who are injured by free trade? And the, the, a, a key answer is trade adjustment assistance. We have to help people um, get employment in new sectors that are internationally competitive. We have to help them retrain, retool, move uh, to new communities. So we can't just have unbridled free trade um, and not deal with the people who are injured with free trade. Now, I'm practical enough to realize that raises a budget concern. We have to allocate the funds um, to help those losers from free trade. But if we don't do that, we'll never get trade legislation through the Lok Sabha or through Congress. So on this issue itself, let me take you to the multilateral framework, which is the WTO. And uh, what, were, what are your views on India's stance on food security at the WTO? And do you think it was correct in holding ground in July and retracting its commitment on the TFA? And yes, I do. And the, yeah. second, and the second part of my question is, and this is more from a power politics perspective, do you believe America's willingness to accede to India's demands in the form of an indefinite peace clause reflects a shift in the negotiating landscape at the WTO? Uh, yes, I do. But yes to both questions. Uh, on the first question, um, I, I remember uh, uh, several months ago uh, touring um, in, in Delhi, the uh, Indira Gandhi uh, home and memorial. And as any of us who are students of, again, you know, modern Indian history know, um, India has had a long-standing food security concern. Uh, you can visit her house and you can see the newspaper articles uh, there on the walls that talk about food security and uh, India uh, being self-sufficient uh, in, in food grains. And this, is, this has been a concern you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And, and um, uh, students of Indian history also know about the Green Revolution in Punjab. So this is not a new thing that Indian trade negotiators all of a sudden invented uh, in the run-up to the Bali ministerial in December 2013. This is a, you know, before you go into a trade negotiation, you want to know a little bit about the history of the country with which you're negotiating. So hopefully, um, the U.S. side uh, appreciated, um, if not before Bali, now after, that this is a long-standing concern. Now, uh, to be fair to the U.S. side, they do have a point. Part of India's food security problem is India namely infrastructure. Um, there, we know, we all know um, as travelers and visitors and residents in India that the infrastructure needs perhaps a trillion dollars worth of modernization. Otherwise, um, aside from uh, get, making it difficult to just get around on roads and, and railway, um, it, a lot of food stored in grain silos is, is wasted. It's rotted. It, it's eaten by rats. Um, so. 
the, the U.S. has a good point there. Um, the question is how to make that point in, um, in a trade negotiation. Is it, is it right to draw a line and say, look, we're not going to give in at all, um, and we expect you to sign the trade facilitation deal, um, and we're not going to extend the peace clause. You've got to solve your problem now. Um, and thus imperil the very government that's the most free market reform oriented, which is the BJP? Or is it better to give some ground um, and say, look, all right, we'll extend the peace clause, you know, indefinitely until we solve this green box public stockholding issue. Um, let's move forward on trade facilitation. You know, any, that was the solution before Bali that ought to have been reached and would have saved the WTO a lot of headache. Uh, in time. It was pretty obvious. It's a very common sense solution um, if you know, know a little bit about Indian history, modern Indian history and this food security issue. Um, they got there. They eventually got there. It just took an extra year. Now, your second question then is, does that result in a, a fundamental negotiating shift? Um, yeah, uh, to be sure, even in the early days of the Euro in the early days when the Uruguay round was being contemplated in, in the uh, uh, early 80s, 81, 82, 83, um, it was clear that India was a force to be reckoned with because India was not thrilled with the idea of a TRIPS agreement or the GATS agreement. Um, so India has always been an important player. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think this time um, when um, India took the position it did at Bali and said, look, this is so important to us, we will walk away from a deal and we will take the heat um, if, we, if we need to. Um, I think that, um, uh, that's something, that's a tactic that the U.S., the EU and other countries have used. So it's not fair to accuse India of, of holding up a deal when other countries have used that same tactic on, an, on a key issue. I mean, look, U.S. negotiators have said in, at earlier points in the Doha round, um, we're not going to give in on weakening anti-dumping and countervailing duty laws. Otherwise, you know, if we don't get that, we walk. So countries do this on key issues. You just don't want to do it too often. Um, the fact that India did it and did it successfully um, and probably did it with a lot of backing from other developing countries who didn't feel that they could speak up as vocally as India. That, that does result, I think, in a little bit of a, um, a shift um, or an acknowledgement that, that the power balance has changed a little bit. And I'm not saying that with, a, you know, with any uh, sense of triumphalism. Uh, I mean, I'm on both sides as an Indian American. It's just a, it's just a reality. And, and I guess the, the question which maybe you, you didn't uh, ask yet, but maybe you were getting to is, well, where does that lead us? Um, and I hope it leads us to a better understanding of each side, uh, the Indian and the American side, so we can anticipate when we're, we're cutting to the bone, you know, when we're really getting to a fundamental issue um, that would cause the other side to um, block a, a deal. If, and lawyers are supposed to anticipate those issues and solve them in advance. So hopefully um, with this experience, um, we'll do a better job of that next time. So this is, this is something which has happened within a multilateral framework where each country enjoys an equal reputation before the floor. But now what we are seeing is the emergence of mega trade deals such as the TPP and the TTIP. And do you believe these mega deals are going to undermine the legitimacy of an organization such as the WTO? Um, no. Uh, first of all, because uh, GATT in Article 24 um, specifically gives uh, um, permission for uh, WTO members to enter into free trade agreements and customs unions. So, in other words, the drafters of GATT back in 1946 and 47 anticipated uh, that there would be such deals, and in fact, they had seen such deals in their own lifetimes. So, um, uh, they, 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 they saw these FTAs as second best solutions. The first best solution is always multilateral trade liberalization. But if, if we can't get to that first best solution immediately, and we need to um, use an FTA as a, a stepping stone or a building block towards broader multilateralization, 
uh, multilateral trade liberalization, we will. And we've seen examples of that. Um, for example, the NAFTA rules on IP uh, and the NAFTA rules on uh, trade and services predated the Uruguay round by a couple of years. And once the U.S., Canada, and Mexico agreed to those, um, they took those negotiating uh, agreements from NAFTA and vaulted them into the Uruguay round. Um, and I think, uh, so that's one point. I think the, the, the drafters of GATT anticipated um, that sometimes FTAs and customs unions are stepping stones, and we've seen examples of that. I think a second reason why I don't think um, uh, agreements like TPP or TTIP will undermine the multilateral trading system is that businesses always search for new markets. Suppose hypothetically TPP and TTIP enter into force. Well, that'll be great for many businesses that'll expand their market. But at some point, those businesses will say, you know what, the TPP or the TTIP markets are relatively saturated. So we're going to start looking for new markets. China's not in TPP, or um, uh, Canada's not in um, uh, TTIP. Um, there, there would be two bilateral. It would be a Canada-EU, and there would be a TTIP with the U.S. and EU. So businesses might say, come on, let's get China and TPP, and let's get uh, a three-way agreement um, between Canada, among Canada, U.S., and EU. So there will always be pressure. There will ultimately be pressure from producer exporters in an FTA to expand that FTA um, and, and continue to develop their new markets. So uh, that will then lead them naturally to think about, well, can we do this at the WTO level? Only when they're frustrated at the WTO level that they've been, as they have been at the door, do they revert back to FTA. The third reason I don't think uh, TPP and TTIP will undermine the WTO is the WTO does have um, at least uh, three values aside from negotiating multilateral deals. First of all, it's a great monitoring mechanism. We've got a um, trade policy review mechanism. We've got the committees for the various agreements that publish reports and identify issues. So the monitoring function of the WTO is important. Um, a second function that the WTO um, still will play is the DSU, the Dispute Settlement Understanding. That's still the crown jewel um, in, uh, in modern multilateral trade law. It's still effective, um, and we still see compliance in most of the vast majority of cases by the losing side. And the third role that the, the WTO um, plays is, is, is even is negotiation, but in a smaller context, even if it can't reach a, a broad, horizontal Doha round deal, it can still achieve um, limited successes, like, for example, the Article 31 TRIPS amendment uh, that was achieved in the December 2005 Hong Kong ministerial meeting on compulsory licensing, like the trade facilitation deal, perhaps like the information technology agreement. Some of these are plurilateral, some of these are multilateral, but they're, they're, they're limited and they're still useful deals. So, um, uh, and in an economically meaningful way, if at all. I mean, I'm still quite skeptical at this juncture, I mean, sitting here in December 2014, based on what we know, that we will ever see a TPP uh, or a TTIP. Uh, Probably TPP is more likely than TTIP. Um, TTIP is a tougher agreement because that really is a regulatory harmonization agreement. That's, that's almost less about trade and more about regulatory harmonization. Um, and when you get into regulatory harmonization, you get into issues of culture, um, different views in the U.S. and EU about food safety, for example. Um, TPP is going to be equally, is going to be a little, a little bit less tough, but still difficult. Um, to enter into force because you look at the gaps in positions on everything from rules of origin on textiles and apparel to labor uh, and environmental issues to traditional trade issues like um, farm subsidies, farm uh, tariffs in Japan um, to uh, data exclusivity um, and evergreening of patents. Um, there's, there are some vast gaps. Now, of course, 
none of us knows for sure because there ha these negotiations have been largely in secret. We haven't seen texts, but um, you know that's an additional reason why I I'm, I'm not too worried that FTAs are going to undermine the WTO because there's a lot more um, rhetoric surrounding FTAs than there is legal reality um, and and practical commercial reality around the FTAs. My next question to you and my last one is actually with respect to the TTIP and specifically the I in TTIP which is investment and as you're aware there's a there's a heated debate going on between the uh, on the inclusion of the ISDS clause within the uh, within the framework of TTIP and uh, US wants a a more <coughs> structured protection regime for the foreign investors whereas the EU wants some sort of regulatory sovereignty and autonomy for the host state over here I want to know from you is where do you stand on this issue and uh, do you think the model that has been prescribed as of now and that has been the topic of much debate will actually cause this regulatory chill and the third part of my question is do you think it is time for investor state arbitration to move to a multilateral framework rules based framework such as a WTO dispute settlement system. Well, I, I apologize to you at the outset of this question because I, I, I'm not an expert in, in international arbitration uh, or in the different ISDS models. So I, I, I hope I'm, I'm uh, giving you some insights, but, but I'm not sure that I, I will be able to um, be of, of tremendous service to you on this question. Um, let me try and lay out the land a little bit. Uh, from, one, from one side, um, uh, ISDS seems to be accused of being a, a corporate court, um, that it's where uh, corporations can go and get favorable rulings that impinge on the sovereignty of member countries to regulate a particular product. And the case we see of that is Australia uh, and um, uh, plain packaging on, on tobacco rulings. Um, on the other side, um, we, we see that those who champion the ISDS, they say, well, you know, look, this, it's, it's, it's efficient. Um, it avoids problems in local courts, including sometimes corruption. Um, and it makes investment more attractive because, after all, CEOs, when they're looking where to place a, a foreign direct investment, look at the rule of law framework, contracts, property rights, IP regimes and also the ability to resolve disputes in that rule of law framework. And if they don't find the local courts um, uh, satisfying, then they, they naturally want to have an ISDS. Um, and we've seen examples of that in uh, NAFTA, and CAFTA. Um, and um, then I ask myself as a, you know, as a trade uh, lawyer, well, where, where is the room for some compromise? Um, because usually uh, the, the issues are not so full, um, uh, black and white, yes, no, on, off, like free trade protectionism where we started off. So um, it's possible that an, uh, to, so, to, solve, uh, to, to, to um, uh, uh, mollify both sides, it's possible to create ISDS mechanisms uh, in, an F, in a TTIP or an FTA that has limited subject matter jurisdiction, perhaps, um, that covers you know, only certain issues, that takes them out of the local court, but leaves other issues to the local courts uh, to decide. And then, then the, the, in, the uh, host nations can feel comfortable that they won't um, uh, have their sovereignty infringed on core issues that matter to them, like maybe anti-smoking legislation. Whereas investors will feel that, all right, look, this is about securities laws and IPO uh, of stocks and bonds, and that stuff would go to the, the, uh, the ISDS tribunal. And that's what we really care about. So I, I, in other words, instead of 
having a stalemate between yes ISDS or no ISDS create a court of, of limited jurisdiction. That might work. Um, you know, again, I apologize because I, I'm, not, not a, I'm not an expert in arbitration. I really would defer to my, my colleagues who are on that. Well, it's nevertheless, it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to have you for this interview, Professor Bala. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure, and, and, and may I say both uh, Dunya Vad and also uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. To you too, to you too, Professor Bala. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you. Thank you.